greet each other uh, with these words, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So we'll stand to sing our opening hymn, just thinking about that living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it's an old uh, classic, uh, and Carol's going to be playing, playing for us in the organ, this wonderful classic, Holy, Holy, Holy. <coughs> this living God and we don't want to pretend to be what we're not we don't want to uh, pretend to be holy and good when we're not we want to own up to our sins and failures and the things we regret in this past week and even this morning we can bring all that to this living God and be open and honest with him and because of Jesus he will forgive us and cleanse us and restore us so let's pray together with these words. We say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, then the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. We Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll say these words together as well as we confess our sins. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, 
Forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. So may the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And then we're going to have the collect for today. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love, grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that always abiding in you, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service, through Jesus Christ your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to have our it just seems a slide, there you, our first reading, which is taken from James three, James chapter three, verses one to twelve. William's going to read that for us, and the words will appear on the screen. If you've got a Bible with you, you can read along. The words will appear on the screen as well. Good morning, church. Good morning. The first lesson is taken from James chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Keep digging it. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say, in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder where the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it may great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse the human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree be a olives or a grapevine be a fig? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, William. I believe we have Hannah who's going to come and read to us from the Gospel of Mark. Good morning. Good morning. Hear the Gospel according to Mark. We're going to read from verse Mark chapter 8, reading from verse 27 to 38. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others says Elijah, and still others, 
Christ, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and begun to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he says. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeited their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. This is the Gospel according to Christ. Thank you, Hannah. And we're going to stay with Mark uh, chapter 8. Uh, we're going to be following the lectionary just for the rest of this, uh, the Christian year. And then when the new year starts uh, in Advent, so the Christian year starts a little bit earlier, then uh, we'll have some, a new series. But we're going to stay with uh, the lectionary for a little bit, and we're in Mark's Gospel. So Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to the end, which Hannah just read for us. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So in this passage, we have the deepest question you'll ever answer, and the most important invitation you'll ever accept. The deepest question you'll ever answer, what's your view of Jesus? And the greatest invitation you'll ever accept or reject. Will you follow him? Will you get involved with Jesus? These words of Jesus ring out through the ages. Who do you say I am? And if anyone wants to become my follower, they must. Well, we'll see. That's what's before us today. Jesus personally addresses each one of us this morning, this very moment. Do we have a clear view of who he is? And do we want to follow him? We may have been following him for many years, but every day is a new opportunity to say, yes, I want to follow you, Jesus. And maybe for the first time you're thinking, oh, I've never once thought about following Jesus, but every day, today, can be the day where we begin to follow Jesus for the very first time. So there are all sorts of views out there about Jesus. He wants, but Jesus, he wants us to see him as he is, not to settle for some false idea of him, some inadequate version that maybe that we've invented in our minds, or a version of Jesus that we'd like to hang out with but to get sight of him as he really is, to get hold of him and not some rubbish idea of him, to meet him and do what he actually says, not what we imagine he says or would prefer him to be like. And he wants to clear away all the confusion and have us see him and get properly on board with him. So he puts this question to his disciples he says, now you may have heard of all kinds of ideas about me, 
all sorts of opinions. What have you heard? What have you heard? What have people said about me? And the disciples say, well, most of the people that we speak to seem to think that you're some kind of prophet. You're one of these anointed spokespeople. Preachers, spokespeople, people, they might, they actually seem to think, Jesus, that you are perhaps the greatest of them all. Whether you're like John the Baptist, who was the greatest prophet of all, and you come back from the dead, or some think, well, maybe he's John the Baptist's role model, the one that John the Baptist was copying, Elijah, they say, oh, you're him, and you're back, and you're, he didn't die, but he's come down from heaven, he's back, you're him, that's what people think you are. John the Baptist, Elijah, or some other prophet, one of these little anointed prophets, Return to bring about the glory days of times past. Spectacular wonders and miracles. Because the Bible does say Elijah will return, so maybe you're him. So people think you're him. So they think you're the best of the best of the anointed prophets. That's what people are saying. And Jesus listens to this and then he says, So, who do you say I am? And our great friend, St. Peter, and we spent some time with him last week, didn't we, St. Peter? He says, well, obviously, the best of the best is not strong enough. It's not strong enough for you. That's too small. You're not that, the best of the best of all these little prophets. You're far beyond that. You're not an anointed messenger. You are the anointed one. You are the divine Messiah, the Christ. You're the one that all these prophets' lives were all about. Elijah, John, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they were all about pointing to you, and you're the, the anointed one that they were all talking about. And Jesus, when he hears Peter say this, he says, all right, all right, keep your voice down, Peter. Don't be spreading that around. And you think, well, why, why would Jesus respond like that? Well, often people, you might have heard this sort of thing where people say, they read Peter's declaration, you're the Messiah. And people will say, well, now Peter and the other disciples have this very limited view of what the Messiah is, what that word means. Peter's just saying, oh, you're this mighty king who's going to overthrow the Romans and take, uh, take control and set up a little kingdom here and now. That's what you are. But I don't think Peter's view is that limited. When he says, you are the Messiah, I don't think he has in mind a Jesus doing some uprising and taking over, setting up a little kingdom. I think, because that would be a totally wrong view for Peter to have, because Jesus doesn't do that. And Jesus isn't interested at all in leading an uprising against the Romans and establishing his own kingdom there and then. And if you remember, if you've read Matthew's Gospel, Jesus responds by saying, he says, Peter, you said this, you're blessed. For you didn't learn this from any human insight. My Father in heaven revealed this to you. So if Jesus seems stunned and impressed by Peter's answer, in Matthew's Gospel, and it seems very hard to see Peter's declaration as deficient if it's been given by the Father in heaven. Unless we want to say that God the Father is not very good at getting his point across or showing Jesus off properly, and we don't want to say that. But what if Peter has actually been granted a massive vision of Jesus, and his answer is right on the money? What if Peter's been given a vision similar to John's in the book of Revelation. So he has seen Jesus as the divine Messiah, the great high priest. And if we remember that this word Messiah or Christ, when people use that word, it just means anointed one. So there are people, when people say that, they're immediately thinking back, well, who else gets anointed in the Bible? Who gets anointed in the Bible? Kings do, prophets do. They get a little bit of oil poured on them. But by far and away, the person most associated with anointing oil is the high priest and his helpers. All these, these priests, they get not, they've got these beautiful robes that they wear 
And you think, look, let's not touch those robes, let's keep them all nice and clean. But no, that's not the case. They get buckets full of oil and dump it all on these priests and they get, they get drenched with this oil. It's all running down their clothes, down their beard and everything. So the priests get absolutely drenched in this oil. And oil in the Bible always seems to represent this lively Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, the life-giving Holy Spirit. It's when you put oil on your face, it's like to, to make yourself feel younger and regenerate yourself and all that. So when you put oil in a lamp and it burns full of energy and life. So the, the Holy Spirit is this one who gives life and, and the, the priest then is the one who's full of, drenched with this oil that represents the Holy Spirit. So the Messiah is this one who's drenched with the life-giving Spirit. That's what Christ means, full of the Spirit, full of life and vitality without limit. Life is dripping from him, covering him head to foot. And all those little priests in the Old Testament, they were just wearing like a superhero costume. That was their costume that was teaching everyone around them this is what Jesus is going to be like. He's going to be drenched with this life of the Spirit. That's what the Messiah will be like. So the one who is the great high priest of the heavens and the earth, that's the picture that people will have when you mention the word Christ to them. He's the great high priest with the limitless life of the divine Spirit. And of course, what the, that is associated with the high priest, life. But the other thing associated with him as well is death. Because the high priest is always going about doing all these sacrifices all day. He's associated with sacrifice every day in the tabernacle and later in the temple the high priest is offering sacrifices. So he's associated both with life, full of life, but also with death. Blood sacrifice and death. So Peter just, it, 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 it didn't take all that into work. Peter, when he makes this declaration, could he be saying, you're this one full of life who is also the one who's associated with blood sacrifice and death? Could it be that Peter has been given something similar to John's vision of the divine Messiah who's both priest and sacrifice? The great high priest who is the Lamb of God and that Peter has been granted that vision of heaven surrounding the divine Messiah who looks like a sacrificial lamb. And Jesus says, Jesus says to him, well, you've seen something huge here, Peter, so don't tell anyone. And then Jesus says, look, this vision that you've had, this declaration you've made, let's talk about it plainly. Let's not look at it in that cosmic divine way. Let me just tell you how it's going to work out in practice. What it's going to look like, because you're going to see me not on a throne with people surrounding me and adoring me, but you're going to see me rejected, tortured, suffering, crucified. In plain sight, and that's what it's going to look like. So I'm talking plainly to you now, Peter, Jesus says, and verse 32 of Mark 8, Jesus says this quite plainly and openly. And maybe it's the plainness of it that Peter can't bear. Perhaps Peter has in mind the Son of Man surrounded by the courts of heaven with angels and archangels and saints all appreciating him as a divine priest and divine lamb. Or maybe Peter has in his mind this idea of a cosmic showdown between the divine Messiah and the great dragon or serpent that we thought about last week, the one who will crush the dragon's head under his heel. Or maybe Peter, well, maybe Peter is just, doesn't really like this whole idea of the divine Son of Man suffering and dying. Maybe that's it. But whatever's going on in Peter's mind, he can't handle it. When Jesus says, I'm going to be rejected, crucified, and die, he takes Jesus aside and says, no, Lord, it can't be like that. That can't happen to you. You can't die a rejected, cursed, humiliated, shameful, embarrassing death. Not that, not that for you. 
And Jesus says, no, Peter, that is what it will be. It won't look epic. It won't be a glorious ceremony with all the company of heaven looking on in adoration as the lamb is placed lovingly on the altar. It will involve actual ugliness and horror and humiliation and suffering and shame. It will be messy and embarrassing and unbearable. And it won't look like an obvious victory, Peter. It will be, but it won't look like it. And Peter says, no, I'm not having that. That can't happen to you. So then Jesus has to say, look, Peter, you're sounding to me like the enemy. The devil talks like that. And we saw that last week. The devil says, oh, come on now, Jesus. Don't be doing all that. That's just silly. No need for all that humiliation. Don't forget yourself in the midst of all this. You're important, you know. You can't be doing this undignified cross thing. You must have a bit of self-respect, Jesus, and self-preservation. That's what the devil sounds like, and Jesus has already rejected that, so he says, Peter, you're sounding like that. No. This shameful, messy death may look like total failure, but it's my glory. It's my glory. My glory looks like shame and humiliation and sacrificial death and people not understanding me, people rejecting me, making fun of me. That's my glory, Jesus says. To see me reigning in the highest heaven, the divine Messiah and Son of Man, yes, that's wonderful. But the real question is, can you bear to see the Son of Man as a baby in a manger needing his nappy changed? As the Son of Man not having anywhere to sleep at night? Can you bear to have him wash your feet like a servant? Can you bear to see him dying on a cross, this shameful, cursed death? That's the glory of God, Peter. That's what the living God is like. That's what he holds up for the world to see, and that's what all the company of heaven praises him for, because he gives up his life to sort out our mess and sin and selfishness. The one full of life just gives it all away so that we can be fixed and healed and sorted and reconciled and restored and all that. So Jesus is saying all that idea of glory and appreciation without sacrifice and suffering, that's a human idea. You need to get your mind of what excites the living God, and that is God suffering and dying on the cross. That's the divine mindset that you need, Peter. So then, and we're just at this last little section, Jesus calls the crowd together and says, listen, if you want to follow me, this is what it involves. I'm going to walk this road of self-denial and death so if you want to follow me, you're going to have to join me on that road. You can try to hold on to life and glory here and now, but you'll lose it in the end. But if you let go of life and get hold of me, Jesus says, just let go of life, just hold it lightly, just hold on to me, Jesus says, in the end, you'll have life forever, immortal life. You'll be full of this life of God, the life of heaven, the life of the ages. Just as Jesus is the one full of life without measure, he'll share that with us. If we just are prepared to say, all this passing world with all its, the life that it offers, that's rubbish compared to him. Just give me Jesus and he'll share his life with us. And as we let go of this life and follow him, pick up our cross and follow him, we'll get life as we get hold of Jesus. But that comes only when we let go of this fleeting life, pick up our cross and go with him, and get hold of him, and walk his way, the divine Son of Man, who came not to be served, but to serve. And what will that look like day to day? What will it look like to pick up your cross and follow Jesus? Well, for Elijah, it looked like being on the run for most of his life, hiding out like scared for his life. 
for John, for, for John the Baptist, he ended up locked up and murdered in a pathetic way that basically had a dinner party gone wrong and everybody looking at John was like, what a failure. But how glorious. John's the greatest of all the prophets. And he gave up that his glory to have this really quite embarrassing death. But we still talk about him in hushed tones, John the Baptist. For Peter, it meant giving up his fishing business to plant churches with all the heartache that that brought. And eventually, he ended up being crucified like Jesus. But perhaps by then, he, was, he said, well, I'll take that shame. But let me even be more degraded by hanging upside down. So he does all that. For each one of us, it could look very different. For it could be that most of the service that we do, no one will ever notice it. And that's not because in church we want to notice and affirm wonderful things that people are doing, but sometimes things that are done will be done without people noticing. People praying in the background, people serving, setting up things, and people inviting friends to church, people doing all kinds of things in the background, never noticed, never acknowledged. It could look like endless struggle as you make choices that are all about Jesus and others and church rather than your own best interests. It could look like that, picking up your cross and following Jesus. It could look like loss of career opportunities, all kinds of things, because we set our hearts on Jesus. He's what matters, and we let go of other things that might be important in this world. It will look like a daily battle not to give in to sin and temptation, but to keep coming to Jesus for help. It could look like lots of different things. For each one of us, it could look different. But all of that mundane, day to day, taking up your cross is glorious in the sight of heaven. And it's wonderful when we do it as we walk the road with Jesus. If we have nothing, but we have him, he is everything. And we have everything. And if we give ourselves to him now, even today, maybe for the first time, maybe as we've done every day for years, he tells us that we will be part of that glory and joy when he returns. And he will be not be ashamed of us, verse 38, but will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because this is what we mean to Jesus. Jesus says in this passage, and this will close with this, he says, even if you gain everything in this world, but you lose your own self, that's a bad deal. That's a loss. So he thinks that you, your soul, yourself, is more important, worth more than the whole world. He says that in this passage. That's what Jesus thinks about you. You are worth more than everything in the world to him. He would give everything in the world for you. That's literally true. He died for you so that you could be, he took all responsibility for all the mess and things you're ashamed of. He'd do all that for you. He'd give up his own life for you. And so this morning, let us take up our cross and follow this Jesus, whatever that means, whatever that looks like. Because if, even if it's suffering and not being recognized now, and it's all heartache and pain and now, at the end, there's him and there's his life and glory and joy forever and ever. So therefore, to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed all the praise, all the glory, all the majesty, and all the power now and forever. Amen. We're going to uh, sing just in response, as we think about Jesus, this divine priest and sacrifice, the words of this song. Now, I don't know if it's familiar to you, those of us who do know it, and I know Carolyn, you know it as well, so we're going to sing out, and you can just listen in if you want this uh, for meditation, and if you don't know the words, that's fine, uh, but let's sing if we know it, my Lord, what love is this. An extended introduction. <laughs>
actually. But, uh, so let's declare our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in God the Father. Let's go skip this slide. Just one second. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lawrence is going to come now and lead our intercessions. This week, let our prayers reflect the challenges we face as a nation. As we seek to help those who have been displaced by Afghanistan conflict, and those who seek shelter in this country as a safe haven. Let our prayer also reflect the issues with social care and the family. And let our prayers reflect that God is calling us to be disciples on this earth. In response to this morning's prayer, the Lord in your mercy will be here. So Lord, in your mercy, Let's bow our heads as we offer up our praise to God. Let us pray. Loving God, hear us as we pray for your church. Make us all one, that the world may believe in us. We pray for all leaders of the church, leaders in our community our country and world. We pray for Andrew, for Vanessa, for Jill. We think the passage from James states that ships, even though large are driven by and driven by strong winds, are steered by a very small raft. So we thank you for their guidance, dear Lord, as they help us to navigate the perils and dangers of this world. We thank you for their wisdom and we ask that their words will continue to enlighten and transform us as we go through our daily work. And we ask that their words will be accompanied by actions. We thank you dear Lord for all those who work to ensure that our building is safe and a bright place to worship, where groups can gather and meet and they can do so with the knowledge that they are in a safe place where they can worship and undertake your work. Great will be their reward, dear Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for our government and our their advisors. We ask that you give them wisdom integrity and courage in the decisions that they make. Help them to have an open mind and listen to the views of others. With the financial crisis, dear Lord, affecting social care and social care budgets, we lift up to you all those in care homes and all those in need of social care. We pray that the local authorities and the government will make the correct funding decisions and that money will be used wisely. So we pray for all care homes and all those involved in the provision of service, that they will, be that they will continue to be respected, recognised and appreciated for all their work. And within our church, the Lord let us pray for Paul, who we now work with the social services. Let's pray for the work that he does and the difficult choices he sometimes has to make. But let us also pray for all those unpaid cures, those looking after relatives and friends, 
those who feel helpless and isolated. We pray for those receiving care that they will be valued, treated with dignity and love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for this for your world, a world that is broken and in pain. We pray for Afghanistan and all those who are trapped and afraid in our country. We pray that the state of unrest will diminish and soon become a thing of the past. For all those who have escaped the hostilities and start them fresh in this country, dear Lord, we pray for them. And we pray that our individuals and our communities will openly accept them and be welcoming to them. And that, Lord, they will be able to use this country as a solid rock and a solid foundation. And that their community will be with them through the difficult times. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving God, we pray and ask for compassion for those who are in sorrow and in need. For those who find it difficult to put their trust and faith in you. We pray for the hungry, the poor, the lonely, those who have problems with mental health and who has been very harshly affected by the pandemic. As we commend them, dear Lord, to your mercy and cure, we ask that you feed those who are hungry with the physical and spiritual food that we need. We ask you to have mercy on the poor and the lonely. Grant them their needs. Grant them peace of heart, strength of body, and healing of the mind. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving God, we pray for doctors, nurses, hospital staff, and for all those involved in healing or end-of-life care. Continue to bless them with the knowledge, wisdom, and a caring nature. We pray for all those who are sick, and ask that you draw near to them, and grant them peace of your presence, the healing of your touch. We ask you to give them your guidance and your assurance of love. May all those who are weak and weary walk in hope and faith. We pray for all those who are coming to the end of their journey on this earth. And we pray that they are coming to your presence and kingdom. We pray for all those who are bereaved. And for those whose hearts have been saddened by the death of someone close to them, for members of the family, help them to experience the comfort of your Holy Spirit, the fellowship of this your church, and be with them until they're all reunited in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. And let us in a minute of silence pray for ourselves, our family, and our friends, and those who are known to us and who need our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. our Lord, our God. You have helped us by your grace to make this praise. And you have promised through Christ our Lord that when two or three agree in his name, you will grant what we ask. Answer now your servants' praise according to their needs. In this world grant that we may truly know you, and in the world to come, graciously, graciously give us eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Lawrence. I'm going to share the peace with one another and uh, as we come to communion, and it's um, we've been doing this uh, sign language one, which is peace of the Lord be always with you. Is that right? So we'll uh, say the peace to one another and we'll, we'll use that way. And then we're going to sing uh, just this uh, uh, song just uh, after the peace, uh, which is uh, from heaven you came, help us be. But let's uh, stand as we share the peace. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We belong to him through faith heirs of the promise of the spirit of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. standing, we'll sing uh, this song. We'll sing from heaven you came, help us pray. So let's sing this together.
please be seated as we uh, pray. The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. So as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So draw near with faith, Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. So we'll do as we've normally been doing. I'll put my mask on, and then uh, you can come to the front and receive uh, the bread. We're just receiving communion in one kind, uh, so that's the bread, and then uh, if you would like to receive, you can put your hand out uh, to receive. But if you would just like a prayer of blessing, then just stand with your hands uh, in front of you. And 
and you can you come to the front and let's uh, take hold of Jesus and feed on him in our hearts as we love and trust him.
we'll say the prayer after communion together. We say, Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We who the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So uh, before we uh, have the words of blessing and the notices, I think um, we're going to, or should we do it the other way around, Lawrence? Yeah, we'll do it that way. So Lawrence is going to come and uh, uh, bring the notices. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, good morning. <laughs> great, thank you very much and welcome. It's great to see so many of you here today, and it's great to see a few new, new faces gradually, so or old faces coming back, I should say. So welcome, and it's great to see you. Um, and what I would say, coming back to see us, please do stay behind this morning with us. Uh, we're going to try and have some coffee and some tea at the social distancing, uh, a bit of social distancing where we have it. So we've got some coffee, we've got some tea, and I think we've got a piece of cake also, don't we? Yeah, uh, so, so yeah, Gloria has its origin at all for us. Yeah, so let's do it. Let's have that and let's have it social, this social distance that we have it. Uh, but it's great to be back and great to be able to do those things. Thank you very much to everyone who's been involved in the service this morning, to Andrew, um, to everyone who's led, and to, well, to Andrew led, Andrew Preach, um, <laughs> um, but everyone who's people who've read and then done the various things, caroling on the, on the organ and piano. It's great to be having music again and being able to sing also, isn't it? So thank you very much, Caroline, and thank you to everyone who is involved. Um, I've got some word news then, should I do this first? Oh, I think Jill wants to say something, so I'll finish first and then Jill can jump in. We've got some birthdays coming up uh, this week. Um, on the 14th, we have Michelle, who is Angus's daughter. Yeah. Um, on the 14th, again, we have a young lady called Hannah. Uh, yeah. It's Hannah's birthday on the 14th. Um, Hannah does a lot of work for us, she really does. Hannah is an inspiration. And you know, if, if there's one person I look up to Hannah, I, I, I haven't said this to you before, but I do look up to Hannah. Um, her prayers are exceptional, and she does so much for the church and so much for us. And thank you very much, Hannah. And you know, God has blessed her with another year. Um, so thank you. But you know, we'll sing happy birthday to you in a minute, so don't run away. Um, we've got another young lady, Ava. Ava's birthday is coming up on the 15th. Um, don't look away, Ava. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, Ava, Ava is part of the PCC and she does some splendid work again for the church and for everyone. So thank you to Ava for everything that you do for us. Um, and let's celebrate your birthday. Um, on the 15th, we have a young lady called Shade. Yay! Shade's birthday is on the 15th. I'm not going to ask you how old you're going to be because a man should never ask a lady her age. All right. Um, but yeah, your birthday's coming up soon. Um, so yeah, you know, he comes along every, almost every week to church and it's great to see you back again with us. All right. And I'm sure God is going to bless you enormously. He will do. And then we also have on the 17th, Inez's daughter. Inez was obviously very busy in the month of September. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to. But we've got Nicole, whose birthday is on the 17th. All right. I tell you what, all those who are having a birthday this week, uh, and Ines, you, you can uh, join us. Please do so. Get, should, we have, should we get them forward so that we can say a prayer for them? And, yeah, so please come come forward for us. Yeah, let's say a prayer with yourself. Let Andrew say a prayer. Uh, and then we can sing a happy birthday song to all of you. Yeah. 
feel the shoe there. They wreck it, stuck. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Th
So it's good to have something which tells me, Lawrence, you're doing it in sessions, or Lawrence, you're just being Lawrence this week. All right. Uh, but yeah, please do so. If you can, if you do want to be on on it, let Jill know. Um, other than that, Jill's going to come forward and speak to yourself for a few minutes. It seems, but have a fantastic week. It's really good to see you. Stay behind for some tea and coffee, so and some cake, socially distancing, and I really look forward to seeing you all next week. Have a better week. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. Well, it definitely is a week for birthdays, isn't it? And thank you, one or two of you, have been kind enough to keep asking me about mum. My mum is 97 this week. My sister, who does a lot of the weekly um, looking after her, is, is also her birthday. I'm going to go down there, so I won't be around next week. But thank you to all those who keep praying. Mum is still really end of her days, but, you know, we, we keep trying to spend time with her. Um, more importantly, um, just to pass on an important greeting to you, yesterday um, I was in Chelmsford Cathedral, we had services in the cathedral all day, three sets of services for all those being ordained deacon, um, Andrew and Manetche were there, uh, it was a friend of theirs was, um, and um, I saw and spoke to, at some length, Alison Kennedy. Now, those of you who've been around for a while remember Alison. Alison was doing all the organisation for the services, which is very complex. We had a nice chat, and she asked after all of you, and she asked that I would bring greetings to you. And I haven't had a chance to uh, catch Andrew up with this, but we had a little plan to maybe invite Alison here one Sunday. She said she would love to come, so, so look out for that. Um, we're going to be trying to do a slot, um, sort of maybe every fortnight, probably with morning prayer, where we do a, an interview slot called This Time Tomorrow, getting people both within our congregation and slightly beyond our con congregation to talk about what their working weeks involve so that we can pray for them. So I think we'll probably get Alison in that slot and you can hear about what the job of, you know, doing stuff in a cathedral is about. Um, but then one more um, notice just for us. Just um, I've spoken a little bit with Jenny and I'm going to be chatting with Gloria about we're going to try and get a regular time during the week when while the weather is good we maybe come together for an hour to work on the garden. So if you are keen to work on the garden, try and speak to me afterwards. We have to try and find a slot that would work for everybody. And I think, Andrew, you were thinking you might pop in on that and perhaps lead us in a little prayer and reflection at the end. So that's another way of us meeting, especially while the weather is good. That's it. Andrew said thank you last week for the warm welcome that everyone has given us uh, and obviously that was echoed for me as well. But I just wanted to say um, sorry that we haven't invited you around for coffee yet because um, we've had family over from Northern Ireland for Andrew's ordination and we've both uh, licensed it. Um, and we've both been taking things a little bit cautiously just uh, until the 10 days has passed just in case. Um, wanting to be overly cautious, we don't want to give you the gift of COVID in the past two weeks that we've been here, um, but towards the end of September, once we're a bit more settled in, um, it would be great to have you um, pop round, have a coffee, maybe have some food in the garden if the weather's good, so I just wanted to say um, thank you and also just to, uh, we, we are keen to hang out uh, and just to explain why we've been a little bit quiet in the last uh, 10 days or so, so uh, yeah. Thanks, Manesha and Jill and Lawrence, and, um, and thank you to those who've um, just shown us a, good, a welcome by giving us uh, flowers and gifts and different things. It's been really appreciated in the midst of uh, moving and getting settled. That's um, really kind. The welcome here has been wonderful, so thank you so much.
Um, we're going to sing, uh, and then we'll have our uh, words of blessing and dismissal. But we're going to sing this final hymn, and we'll stand to sing, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. <laughs> Serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.